So, um, I'm based in a Norwegian energy company called Statoil. I'll come back to the company in a, in a minute. Uh, I joined that organization back in the early 80s, and at that time it was a smaller company than what it is today. And most small organizations, they want to grow, they want to become big, and some succeed. But many discover that we have not only become big, we have also become slow, rigid, bureaucratic. We've lost a lot of that agility, flexibility we had as a smaller organization. And I find an interesting parallel here to the aging process of man. Because as we grow older, we do lose a bit of that agility we had as teenagers. And I'm starting to get some practical experience here. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, and when it comes to man, we have no choice. You know, in the end, age takes us all. Organizations, however, they have a choice. It is written nowhere as far as I've seen. Of course, you are big. You should be rigid, bureaucratic, and slow, and all the things that you need to do. So, our journey at Statoil has very much been about trying to find our way back to that agility we have as a smaller organization without losing the benefit of being big. Our big question how can we be small and big at the same time? The question for a small organizations should be how can we grow without ending up in the same misery? So, what I would like to share with you today is first the bad news, but you know traditional management is broken. The good news is that there are solutions, you also know that, beyond budgeting is one such solution. It's actually a somewhat misleading name. The purpose of beyond budgeting is not necessarily to get rid of budgets. The purpose is to create these organizations which are more agile, more human. In order to do that, we have to blow up traditional management. And what do we find at the core of traditional management? Budgeting process and the budgeting mindset. So that's where the name is coming from. But this is about business agility. Probably the name we would have picked if you could have done this over again. Then I want to share with you how we are trying to do this in Statoil. We started out in 2005, so 13 years ago. I want to share with you uh, what that story is about. I don't want to stand here and, and, and kind of pretend that it's all perfect and just sunshine. It's hard. We've made mistakes. We've stumbled. But that is what real change is about. Real change is never a strike straight line from A to B, but you know that as well. I'd like to continue with a quote from a wise man, yesterday on Pontocopy. He's a director. Most of what we call management is about making it difficult for people to do their job. And I would very much agree. Sometimes the problem is that we manage too much. Performance management, a label I don't like. We don't manage performance. There will be no performance. I don't think that's true. I'll come back to the one. Imagine an organization that a hundred years ago invented a fantastic machine, state of the art, crucial for the success of this organization. Fifty years ago, this machine started to make some trouble. It didn't work that well. Like today, this machine is completely broken. It looks like this. And you will all understand that this is not a true story. In real life, this would not have happened. In real life, already fifty years ago, smart people would have gotten together to fix this, to invent something better, because we all love innovation, right? Innovation is great. We want to be leading it, unique in the forefront, yes. But that enthusiasm for innovation seems to be limited to technology product, maybe services innovation. But there is also something called management innovation. It's about exploring new ways of leading in today's business realities. Management innovation, that is not great. That's scary. Kicking out the budget, are you crazy? What's the consequence of this? The consequence is that it's very crowded here on the left-hand side. Everybody is into technology, product, services, innovation. All our competitors. On the management innovation side, that is not yet a crowded place because it's scary. But that is good news for brave companies who dare to embrace also this kind of innovation because you can get just as much performance, competitive advantage out of management innovation as you can from technology, product, innovation. And there are organizations out there who say that we have no competitive advantage whatsoever when it comes to technology products. We find it in the way we lead and manage. And I have a few examples for you a bit later. So it's all about performance defined in the right, right way. I would like to talk a little bit more about that important word performance, um, but now in a slightly different setting than business organizations. And some of you know that I like to use traffic as a metaphor. Because in traffic, when we are out driving, we would also like to experience good performance. In my definition would be a good flow and a good safety. Um, by the way, I never understood why they call it rush hour traffic. 
to rush at all. Those cars are standing dead still. But, you know, there's so much I don't understand. So, anyway, I think traffic authorities want the same. And here is something you often need to talk about traffic authorities to create a safe and good flow. Two questions. Who is in control here? And based on which information? This is the good old-fashioned traffic light. There's no high-tech, no sensors. So the one who is in control here is the guy who programmed this light. Where is that person as you sit waiting for that green light? Somewhere else. And which information would this program be based on? It would be based on some historic events, maybe some forecast, but it would not be entirely fresh information as you sit there waiting for that green light. But again, the best of intentions try to create a safe and good flow. Then there is a very different solution with exactly the same purpose. The roundabout, traffic circle, or whatever. Who is in control? We are as drivers. Based on which information? Based on fresh, real-time, here and now information. So it could be, since we arrive at so very different answers, it could be interesting to compare a bit more these two ways of managing. So let's do that. And I've got a few leading questions for you here. Which is normally most efficient? Normally. It's been proven. It's the wrong. Which is most difficult to drive in? Of course it's the roundabout. And going back to our organization for a minute, everything we are trying to leave behind in Statler of traditional management is from a leadership point of view. Much easier than the stuff that we know are trying to do. Our guiding star cannot be to go for what's easy because it's easy. We have to go for the stuff that is good for performance to find it in the right way. Leadership is actually not meant to be easy. Final question here. Is it relevant to talk about values in the setting of traffic? Uh, in Stator, we have something we call the Stator book. It's our most important document. It talks about who we are, um, what we believe in, how we work. And it's not a coincidence that I'm holding a, a printed version in my hand. Of course, it's available online, but that is on purpose. And this book, book talks a lot about values-based management. The opposite of values-based management, we can maybe call rules-based management. The traffic light is a good example of rules-based management. Red is stop, green is drive, blue is just yellow, but beyond that, very simple rules-based proposals. If there is a value set, a mindset among drivers waiting for that green light, which is about me first, I don't care about this. That mindset is not a big problem in front of that light. But in the roundabout, me first, don't care about the rest, is actually a big problem. Because in the roundabout, we are much more dependent on everybody having a common positive purpose of wanting this to go well. We have to help each other. We have to make own intentions visible, interpret other people's intentions. We have to interact with people in a very different way than we need to do it in front of that light. Two other important words before we leave traffic, trust. Ahead of that traffic light, traffic authorities are not customers to make decisions. They do in the wrong way. The other important word is transparency. Ahead of that light, the only thing you need to see in order to make your decision, stop or drive, is in theory the color of the light, not the answer. In the roundabout, you need to see everything in order to make the right decision. So transparency is key. And I don't like that label performance management for different reasons. Um, it's a very negative word. Um, but it's highly relevant when you talk about the traffic lights. That's exactly what traffic authorities are doing. Managing performance very actively. The roundabout is about something else. That is about enabling performance, creating conditions for great performance to take place. And this is more than playing with words. These are two fundamentally different ways of thinking about these important issues. And the Stator work. You no longer contain the word performance management. It's gone. We talk a lot about enabling performance, developing performance. Performance management is gone. So, um, the roundabout is a more self-regulating way of managing. Self-regulation is another important word here. And I would argue when we now leave traffic and we move to our organizations that in today's business realities, organizations need more self-regulating management models for at least two reasons. The first reason has to do with all the VUCA out there, the volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. If we take that VUCA seriously, it should have implications for how we design our management models compared to uh, if there was no VUCA out there. And when I joined Statoil and had um, uh, my first management job back in the early 80s, there was a lot less VUCA than the water is. By the way, my first management job in Statoil was the head of the corporate budget department. Know what I'm talking about, and I share with you how stupid it is. 
Uh, so that is a reality we need to reflect on. The other reality is not external, it's internal, it has to do with people. Asking ourselves, what kind of people do we generally believe that we have in our organizations? And one language for that important discussion uh, was developed by good old Douglas McGregor back in 1960, great book, Human Side of Enterprise. Theory X and Theory Y. These two opposing views of people, what motivates people? Theory X, a very negative view, a view that most people in an organization is a bunch of potential teachers. What the man teachers, is it not? We you know what will happen. Or run away with a lot of stupid things and really like drunken sailors. Theory Y, very much the opposite view, and the more positive people view. I mean, a view that beyond all the education and competence, that most people actually want to do a good job. They want to be involved, they want to be listened to what they're treated as adults. We don't need to be free so far on where our sympathy lies, X or Y. I don't know, I have my hopes. Uh, but it should be very easy to agree that if we may believe in Y, the implication for our management model must will be very different compared to if we may believe in X. That should be a no no way. If we combine these two realities, it could look like this, and I would argue that traditional management lies in this lower left hand corner. The conscious or unconscious assumption that the world is still a quiet, planable place, and that the people is on the, on the X side. Um, if we disagree with that, that is not the place to be, and we need to move up to that upper right hand corner. What we need to leave behind is traditional management. Rigid, detailed, annual, very rules based, a lot of micromanagement, centralized command and control. Of secrecy and a strong belief in sticks and carrots as ways to drive performance. Maybe there was a time when this worked. Maybe there still are some places where this worked. But for us, in start on that discussion, it's very uninteresting. But we know that our business environment is up here. There are a lot of them. And we believe that most people in Statoil is on the Y side and not on the X side. But not everybody. Every time I talk about X and Y, the same faces are popping up in my head. I can see those guys right now. Those faces belong to colleagues of mine at Statoil, but I may be put on the X side. I'm not saying they are crooks, but you understand what I mean. But that is not the point. There might be some faces popping up in your heads as well, no. Because these people you typically find in most organizations. But that is not the question. The question is, do they represent a majority or a minority? If they exist that represents a minority, then we cannot let minorities drive the design of our management models. Right? We need to start with our majority view. And if that is why, that must drive sign. And then we need to find other ways to deal with these guys on the X side. This is just like in a, in a free society. We are not putting everybody in jail. If somebody has done something wrong, right? we are all free citizens to a certain level. So, what do we need to do? Address both dimensions on leadership, more values based than rules based. This does not mean that we shouldn't have rules. It simply means that the stronger we are on the value side, the fewer rules we could be given. Or autonomy. In this VUCA world, there isn't time to learn nine floors of the definition. And with these people on board, it's similar. Very often they can make great decisions for themselves. We need more transparency so that important world is coming back. And this is good news for all the scared managers I've met over the years. Who are afraid of leaving that other comfortable corner down there on the left because they are afraid of losing. What is the of losing? Control. And that fear is real. I can see it in their eyes. But maybe what they haven't understood is that they're not that control is nothing but the illusions of control. Fear is still real. So here's some good news for scared managers. Transparency can actually be quite an effective control mechanism, social control. There is a reason why most these traditional teaching groups prefer to operate at night or in the dark. And I'd love to share this nicely in a story that you might have heard about from the Bush. This pharmaceutical company, quite traditionally managed, but they did a very interesting experiment around travel budget. Kicked out in a pilot, kicked out the travel budget, all the travel rules and regulations, replaced it with full transparency. With a few exceptions, everybody could see everything. If you traveled, where the size need to meet, meet the cheap price. Guess what happened with travel budget? That's a leading question. But this was achieved through a very self-regulated regulating control mechanism. This was a question of tearing off pages with the rules that have ever been built. And finally, internal intrinsic motivation. And I probably don't need to tell you um, what uh, research is telling you about that important issue when it comes to knowledge work and knowledge organizations, where individual bonus um, 
is not the most powerful for that kind of work. It's eaten clearly by a lot of other things, including mastery, purposes, belonging, autonomy, and things that have one thing in common beyond the fact that they are free. They are about leadership. It takes a bit more effort to motivate people to leadership with the dangle that they got money in front of their nose and say, do this and get that. So, in Stator, we have always tried to be a values-based, people-oriented uh, company. I'm not saying we're perfect, but it's always been important for us. This book talks a lot about it. But our challenge was maybe more that as we were growing, we were adopting more and more management processes that had a different message. Because it doesn't help to have these theory Y leadership visions if you have theory X management processes. Like, for instance, tradition. And in a lot of organizations, that is the case. Based on creating poisonous gaps between what we preach and what we practice. So, what we have tried to do on the management process side, vertically here, is to change these management processes to better affect what we say about people in that book, what we mean about people, while at the same time making these management processes more useful. So, here are the examples of things that typically are. Typically, you have to do something with the additional budget. Forget the business of identity unless you take a, um, unless you challenge the budget of process radically. But, but either it's to go or be, be radically changed. More specifically, it is when we set target goals to then push them better, uh, thinking more than that. It doesn't help that we hit 29 points. The mission is achieving the budget of 35 points or so. We need more dynamics into our processes. The stuff we are talking about here, why should all of that circulate around January? For that is an artificial period of a business point of view, typically. We need to organize these processes more on a business driven, event driven rhythm instead of a calendar driven rhythm. Finally, form and evaluation does not be about something more than comparing two numbers. That is too narrow, too dumb, uh, too simple. We need a holistic form of evaluation. I will go back to what that is. And this, dear friends, is a crash course in beyond budgeting. Not beyond budget either. Addressing both leadership and management processes in a coherent, consistent way in order to become more agile and more useful. Not necessarily as a goal in itself. This is what it takes to compete in a positive sense in today's business and economics. There's a number of companies on this journey today in some form or shape. Here are some of them. And I could have talked the rest of the day and tomorrow about fantastic management innovation taking place here. Um, and you probably know many of these organizations. I'm going to quickly limit myself to two companies, and then we have to move on. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry about the rush here, but the, the big story is a short answer. So, uh, please forgive me. Um, let's start in Norway. On the left hand side, the top, we reach an IT company called Miles. As people in Norway and in India, Miles has no budgets, no targets. Only nothing about what we call traditional management. There's just a lot of fantastic focus. Um, enormous growth. Um, and have one process which they see is very important. And that there's a lot of emphasis on recruitment. Recruiting people. Simple philosophy, if you get it right, that recruit the rest of us. But when Mars is interviewing, they never take less than 10 references. When management is interviewed, the whole interview is about the candidate values that they need to have I don't talk about it at all. They need checking IT competence to skilled IT people or they go. And by the way, they have a veto right. If they say no, it will go. It's not going to Amazing company. If you work for miles, your PC is important. And it's important to attend conferences and, and, and courses to maintain and develop your competence. If you work for miles, you can buy whatever PC you want, as expensive as you want, and replace it as often as you want. No PC budget. You can attend whatever conference you want, wherever in the world, as often as you want, no travel budget or conference budget. The only thing Miles requires is that when you have bought that piece, you turn from that seminar and training. That's the cost of the internet, what you did, and the cost of it. It's the only component. And the only small concern, not a big concern, is could it be too effective? Are people trying to find good enough pieces? Are they taking a lot of money? Isn't that a luxury problem? It's nicer to encourage people to buy better stuff, take more training, do the opposite. Okay, nice. Wonderful example. 
the veteran here is the company in the middle on the top, Swedish bank called Handelsbanken, that today has around 800 branches across Europe. It's the fastest growing bank in the UK. This bank has no budgets, no targets, no nothing again. Um, and they have been doing this for a long time. They kicked off the budget and a lot of other stuff already back in 1970. Well, that's interesting. The big question is still, is it good for performance? Look at the facts. Hundreds of companies have been performing better than the average of its competitors every single year. It's the most cost-effective universal bank in Europe without cost budgets. And they never, never needed a bailout from the authorities because they missed it up. Not a coincidence, radically different management model, a lot of decentralization, a lot of autonomy, a lot of transparency, a lot of simple benchmarking, no individual bonus, only common bonus scheme. Um, really, very different from how most other banks are. are uh, hundreds of and some other companies, they inspired what became known as beyond budgeting in the late 90s. And yes, we were a few years ahead of the Agile Manifesto, but the point is that we came work roughly at the same time, and there's a lot of similarities between the two. As you will see, um, it's, it's, um, we haven't the four on the top, we go straight to 12, uh, but again, it addressed both leadership and management processes. And I don't have to, time to go through this in detail. You know, I have talked a little bit about on the leadership side, purpose, values, autonomy, transparency, but I'll come back to a few of the things on the management process side. And we know we'll move to staff in a minute. But a few important messages around these principles. These principles do not represent any kind of remedy. They are principles that just provide guiding inspiration of what they should mean in an organization. Depends on that organization's business, cultural history. And that's the way it should be. I don't like management recipes. And there are quite a few of them out there, even also in the agile community. And I don't like those recipes because in a management recipe, somebody has done all the thinking for you. Your only job is to implement other people's thinking. I find that quite boring. Or quite dangerous. Here, you have to think for yourself. What is it me? This is also an attempt to create coherence between what we preach on the left hand side of the practice and the right. Two classical examples of the opposite. It doesn't help if we on the left hand side talk loud and warm about how fantastic people we have on board. And this is the uh, executive talking, how fantastic we are. And we would be done. And we trust the much. But not that much. Moving to the management processes, principle 10, travel budget. Are you crazy? Kicking out the travel budget? Just imagine what would happen. Right or wrong, I'm just saying that this is the focus. Teaching one thing, practicing another thing. Another classic example, does it help that we talk equally loud and warm, left inside about we and us and together and team and everybody in the same boat? All right. Moving to management processes, principles, it's all about the middle focus. Right or wrong, democracy. Finally, finally, uh, understand classical misunderstanding and what we beyond budgeting. Some people think it's just another way of, ma of managing profits. Yes, yeah. so it is. Principle 10, but there are 11 other principles. Second misunderstanding also linked to that principle. No budgeting, no budget, cost is not important. I can spend what I write. Sorry, guys. Cost is still important, there will always be for space. This is about how can you optimize in a more intelligent and effective way within a constraint than what a 100 year old management technology can offer. That is the H of this management this, uh, this technique. Uh, so, let's leave beyond budgeting and let's move to stat oil. Uh, this is us in a nutshell. Oil, gas, and renewables, uh, Scandinavia's largest company. Um, we are uh, getting bigger and bigger within the renewable en energy simply because we acknowledge climate change. And we know we are part of the problem. We know we need to think about the solution, both short term and long term. And that is why we are leveraging our engineering competence to build offshore wind parks. We are good at the big stuff. See? And we, are, we have built the first floating wind park in the world. It means a breakthrough because then you can build these wind farms in a lot of other areas. Yeah, that's uh, that all. Um, our management process is called Ambition to Action and has three purposes. It's about translating strategy and we also into, uh, include management into this. It's about pure agility and it is about activating what we say in this book, 
for people that have dementia. Then there are some steps in this process that as they appear, they might not might be very unique, but the way you do this that is the difference. So translate strategy because the objectives or problems. Then we address risks of not achieving these objectives and general risk in our business. And we identify actions. What do we need to do to achieve those objectives and to manage risk? Very often that is one and the same thing. Then, of measurements, measuring that we are moving towards these objectives. Here's a bit. The first is that nothing happens just for the measure. As I often say, you don't lose weight simply by weighing yourself. And I know, because I've tried. And then uh, my wife gave me a very helpful advice. Doctor, maybe you didn't stand there long enough. Ah. Anyway, um, the point is that nothing happens. Uh, you need something more, that's why it's called ambition to action. And last but not least, the translation into what does this mean for you and me? Let's break into the HR process here. And here is an example of activating the important words in the book. The very first words in the top of the book. The way we deliver is as important as what we do. With the way we deliver, we talk about the values in this book. The weighting between the two, the all consequences. Rear day is 50 50. It's the only thing it could be. But uh, that's one area where we are somewhat different. Let me share with you a few other areas. Um, one has to do with the indicators. It's except that KPIs but it's one of the indicators. Because when we talk about KPIs, we don't get that the IED KPIs stand for indicators. Right? They are indicating something, but they are not telling the full truth. They are not called KPTs, key performance truths, they are not key performance indicators. And we can't base our information management on indications only. So, as I went back to, before we conclude in a performance evaluation, we must take off the measurement glasses and look at the cost measurement. It's not like it is. I've heard it before, not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted can be counted. Measurement can be a good servant, but when it becomes a master, and we are into disaster. Here is an example of an ambition to action. This is actually uh, Statos on the corporate level, uh, the one, and I will not do not do it in detail, but you see that we start with the four, uh, with the four elements I talked about, talked about on the previous slide, and the HR process is as follows. So, going back to this one, this is a very integrated performance process, not a performance management process, all this is a performance framework, and it starts with strategy, run by appliance into HR. We work very closely together. That this shall be a good seamless throughout our, our functions. Um, today we have around 800 of these in the organization, and let me use, spend a little bit of time on this slide towards the end here, on two other areas where we try to be different. The first has to do with alignment. How do we create the red thread throughout these? There is an easy way, the wrong way. It's called cascading. So sitting up in the corporate center, and that's simply instructing all the way down, these are your objectives, these are your APIs, these are your targets. Um, and you know, we find this people, many, many in my community love that kind of cascading. Because after all, we can add up all the local numbers on here, and it matches the corporate number. So we can sleep well at well night. Put things together, don't they? The last lesson. Well, I wish it would be uh, But it isn't, because that top down cascading in our culture, destroys everything related to involvement, commitment, and engagement, then that the add numbers add up is kind of you know, at no value. Still, it can't be an anarchy. It has to be a red thread. We create that red thread through translation instead of escaping. This is, again, more than playing with words. Translation is about that. And this team here shall make their, one of these teams shall make their own ambition to action. And we look around. Further up, we all the way to corporate, left and right. What does our ambition actually need to look like in order to support those we have a relationship with when it comes to ambition level, when it comes to direction? If that translation should go wrong, it's not a big problem, I'll come back to why. But of course, the level of both is what we are paid for. But one reason it isn't a problem is transparency. With a few exceptions of share sensitive information, all of these are open, accessible to all and all. There should be no place to hide the stupid. But that of transparency is not just about control, it's also about learning. We want people to surf around here and look at what other people are doing and get inspired and, 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 and. Um, we 
other area where we try to be different has to do with time. We used to have annual versions of our digital action, so every autumn, these teams make a new local next year. It wasn't a budget process, much better, still an annual. In 2010, we picked out the calendar year, where it's possible, where it makes sense. But today, these teams can change whatever they want on their own ambition direction, and there's an interest, when stuff happens in your own business department. They can change within the objectives, strategy change, they can um, change the KPIs, indicators, they can find a better one, um, or a strategy change. They can even change their KPI targets, but the targets, these targets have lost their meaning. Possible to achieve, but again, this is an NRT, we had a very simple control mechanism around this. We, when this was introduced, we said that if we want to change something, that we still need an approval on that up. We didn't at any time, we still need an approval. That's not a stamp or a signature, but we need approval. If your change is small, you are still informed at the same level. Think of small, always make sure that you inform others. And when this was introduced, people say, great, we love it. But, by the way, what's the thing? What want it also a corporate to define that on the offer. It's impossible. So we have left that to the organization itself. There might be somebody on the left hand side here with a different definition of big call. Somebody on the right hand side. That is that's fine. It's okay, as long as it works both places. Take back to the wrong about self regulation. We would like this to run self regulating as possible. Um, uh, instead of being kind of micromanaged through the public uh, Forecasting. Um, Many go into rolling forecasting. We went for something we call dynamic forecasting. If there's no uh, fixed frequency, no fixed fund horizons, we can update the forecast. This stuff happens to their own business reality, but they feel just twice and can update other forecasts. They should not do that update for us at corporate level. They should do it for themselves in order to manage their own business. Targets. Why should all targets have a deadline of Oh, and by the way, those forecasts are going into a common database. We have a global SFP solution. So at any time when we need it, corporate level, we can tap into that um, information. We can check our financial capacity ahead of a, ahead of a major investment. So. Targets. Why should all targets have a deadline? End of the we, we know why it's like that. It's still meaningless. We would like to see more natural time horizons. It's not urgency. Three months, if it's more complicated, 18 months. We have a band end of um, year uh, targets, but it should be the exception. And talking about targets, okay, just another chapter of our beyond budget year has to be targets. Because we are asking ourselves, do we need all these targets? Do we need any instances of without? And the answer is yes. If you say that you need targets because of not targets, but if no targets, you could probably not know what to do and you are unable to evaluate the targets. That is not true. A target is not the target. What we really want to achieve is the best possible performance given the circumstances. That is what we want to achieve. Setting targets is one way of achieving that. It's not the only way, and it's not necessarily the best. So we are not saying we are going to kick our targets like tomorrow, like some other companies have done, but we have started that discussion. I'm mentioning this because this is a journey that will get braver along the way. In five years' time, we will have discussions we could not have. So, let me finish off with the holistic performance evaluation. And holistic here means two things. First of all, 50-50 between what and how. And it also means that when we shall evaluate what is delivered in business terms, that is defined through ambition of action, directly or indirectly. That evaluation of what is delivered in business terms cannot be reduced to a stupid and simple um, exercise of counting the number of red we are dumping down something, something so important and something so stupid. And our managers would need two qualifications only to do that job. They must be able to count, they can't be colorblind. And we should have somewhat higher expectations to our managers. And by the way, I wouldn't pass. I can count, but I'm halfway colorblind. Anyway, we might start with counting, but then we need to take off the measurement of But these indicators are indicators, they are not necessarily telling the story. We need to pressure test what is measured before we can conclude. And we do that through some simple questions. Uh, I see that, that KPI is green, but have we really moved towards that um, those of the strategic objective that we imply kind of having sense? How are 
Should we punish people who sweat and then completely make it? They have to seem to lowball and get got away with it? What we should As significant changes in assumptions, fail with a bit of such a nature, should it take away? Was there a, um, uh, an earthquake in Japan? Things are a bit difficult. Better that are going bankrupt, making that sales performance in the target. Risks, which, how was risk handled? And last but not least, how uh, sustainable is it? This is for putting a big dosis of assessment of top of pure measurement for the that Those discussions used to result in a rating on a scale from 1 to 5 in both dimensions. I have not marked that rating, I will respond. I have not that rating. That's if rating. Um, it will still be a link to development plans, rewards that will be in, uh, come up. Much more assessment based and, and, and not um, that rating based. And the starting point for that evaluation is that most people in Starter are simply solid performers. Not we have done a very bad job at it. Of course, we have some stars, we will take care of that. Of course, we have some performance issues, we will take care of that. But we shall not be obsessed by kind of rating everybody around this one. A lot of people are happy about that. So, um, what I want to share with you. Um, sorry about the rush. Um, we want to discuss later with some of our coordinates. We want us to come into your own organizations and in the neighborhood. I mean, very much like, like to do that. And if you're on Twitter, and um, I only tweet about this stuff. So no cats and no dogs, no grandchildren. No I promise. If you're even more interested, check out our, our website. We have a project in Wrong Page. We have our 20 year anniversary this year. Uh, in Stockholm, where are hundred based. And, and if you're even more interested, you have just heard the very short version. There is a long version, and it looks like this. I wrote a book about my journey uh, eight, seven, eight years ago. It's just out in the second edition, heavily revised, because so much has happened. And um, given all the stuff that's happened, it might be happening for the but not yet. Thank you very much. We have a uh, couple of questions. Just show your hand. We have two mics. Thank you for the session. Uh, just a question is that did the knowledge play a lot of a role in the way you implemented it? Because I could see a lot of Nordic names. How do you think you know the other cultures or the other parts of the world will see this? It's a good question. We get it often. Yes, we do get some some tailwind from our culture. This model applies across that all, we operate globally. It's just as valid in Angola as it is in Houston. Um, and our experience is that, I mean, take, take Houston, uh, or Angola, let's say. I mean, we, this has actually become a competitive advantage. Because there are, this, in, in those places, there are enough people who want to work for companies like us, even if that 